Hey everyone, welcome back to Thread Education. Today we're back with a story that I am personally very excited to tell. Martin Margiela has often been called the Invisible Man, and it's for a good reason. Despite the wild popularity of his eponymous label, he rarely makes public appearances and he has never given an in-person interview. You may have even heard a rumor that there are no confirmed photos of him in existence, but we'll be addressing that in just a bit. As crazy as all of this is, I've pieced together what little information we have to bring his story to light, and by the end of this video, the most mysterious man in fashion may just be a little less mysterious. So without further ado, let's get into it. This is the history of Margiela. In 1957, Martin Margiela was born in Genk, Belgium. This was before other Belgian fashion designers like Raph Simmons and the Antwerp Six were even around, so this meant that Martin had very little exposure to the fashion industry growing up. In fact, the only real industry in Genk was coal mining, so he was about as far removed from the arts as you can get. That was all about to change, however, because one day he was sitting down watching TV and he happened to see a segment on Paco Rabanne and André Courage, two European fashion designers who successfully ran their own fashion houses. Upon seeing this segment, Martin realized that he wanted to do what they were doing, and so he began his journey into the world of fashion. To fuel his curiosity, he took an introductory course on fashion, and by the time that he'd finished, there was no doubt left in his mind that this was for him. Making the decision to commit himself fully, he enrolled in Antwerp's Royal Academy of Fine Arts. There he learned more about the art of fashion design, and after his graduation in 1979, he began working as a freelance designer. Just to be clear, this does not mean that he was making his own clothes, it means that he was lending his talents as a designer to other labels. For the time being, that was fine, but after nearly five years of this, he decided that he'd like something a bit more consistent, and he was fortunate enough to land a full-time job as Jean-Paul Gaultier's design assistant. At some point, I'll need to make a full video on Jean-Paul Gaultier, but for now just know that he's a boundary-pushing fashion French couture designer, and this is right when his career was really starting to take off. For Martin, this was in many ways a formative experience, because during this time he learned more about everything from designing collections to getting them into stores. And with Jean-Paul, he was doing it at the highest level possible. Another interesting point is that this new job was actually in Paris, so Martin now found himself in what many people consider to be one of the fashion capitals of the world. It was a far cry from Gank, Belgium, but this is exactly what he needed to fully immerse himself into the fashion industry. So overall, things were going great, but after nearly three years of working with Jean-Paul, Martin began to sense the urge that many design assistants sense at some point in their careers. He wanted to start his own label. Now this is where we really start to get a better understanding of Martin Margiela's identity, or at least where we get a bit more information to work with, because truth be told, it's still pretty confusing. As I alluded to in the beginning of the video, he has always been a very private person, and at no point in his journey has he actively sought out the spotlight. But don't let that confuse you, because when Martin launched his own label in 1988 with the help of his business-minded friend Jenny Marins, fashion critics were instantly taken aback by how radical he was. His silhouettes were unlike anything they'd ever seen, he showed a strong affinity for deconstruction, and he liked to experiment with different materials. Not only that, but he had a distinctly unique approach to presenting his collections. Our earliest evidence of this came in 1988 with the presentation of his Spring 1989 collection. This was his runway debut, and I think it's safe to say that he left quite the strong impression. Rather than hosting the show at some fancy venue, he decided to host it in an unassuming cafe that doubled as a theater. As far as the collection itself, he showed a total of 52 different looks relying on a mostly white, black, and red color palette, and made the interesting decision to cover a number of the models' faces. This is giving me some pretty major Kanye vibes, but the point here was to draw attention away from their physical features and towards the clothes that they were wearing. In a similar vein of thought, he had some of the models step in red paint right before walking onto the runway, and this was to draw attention towards the fact that they were wearing tabby boots. Tabby boots would go on to become one of Margiela's signature offerings, but you might be surprised to learn that they actually predate Margiela by about 400 years. It all started in 15th century Japan when people started making split toe socks called tabbies that they could wear with their traditional thonged sandals. And over time, this evolved into a split toe boot called the Jika tabby. This mostly served a functional purpose as people would wear them outdoors, but it did become a staple in the world of Japanese fashion. Fast forward a few hundred years, and it just so happens that Martin Margiela's studies led him to take an interest in Japanese fashion. After learning about the tabby, he got the idea to create a higher-end split-toe boot, and the end result was the now-iconic tabby. 
This is actually something he'd been working on for years before starting his own label, but it finally made an appearance in his debut show and was an instant hit. At first glance, it may have been hard for spectators to see them in the dimly lit cafe, but as the red paint on the bottom stamped hoof-like marks along the runway, they became impossible to ignore, and as soon as the show was over, the orders started coming in. Now before this show, not many people knew the name Martin Margiela other than the few who knew him as Jean-Paul Gaultier's design assistant, but with this stunning presentation, he'd put his name on the map. Many people will tell you that first impressions are everything, so in that department he was doing fine, but in the fashion industry, your ability to parlay initial interest into a sustainable following is what will really make or break you. So after this first collection, the pressure was on. He continued pushing forward, and in 1989, he delivered what many people believe to be some of his most groundbreaking work to date. Once again going against the grain, Martin decided to host his spring 1990 show on a playground in the outskirts of Paris. That may sound a bit random, but his intention was to make the show feel authentic and open to the public. As a matter of fact, it was open to the public, and there were no formal seating arrangements. This didn't go over too well with members of the fashion media, because they arrived to discover that the front row seats they were accustomed to sitting in had been taken by young children. You see, Martin felt bad that the playground would be closed for a few days while they were setting up the show, so he began thinking of things he could do for the kids in return. His first thought was to send them all on a field trip out to the French countryside, but then he had an even better idea. He approached each of the local schools and asked if they'd be willing to make invitations for his show in their art classes. All of the schools agreed, and Martin was handed back nearly 500 unique invitations. As his way of saying thank you, he then invited all of the kids who designed them to attend his show, and that is why we see them sitting in the front row. Now, seeing as they were just children, they had no regard for the type of etiquette one would normally expect at a high-end fashion show, and while this would be a nightmare for most designers, Martin loved it. The kids stole the show as they posed for the camera, sprinted onto the runway, and one even climbed onto the shoulders of a model. And while this was all exciting, don't let this distract you from how great the collection itself was. He focused much of his attention on proportions with this one, resulting in a unique look that was wide at the waist and narrow on top. In addition to this, he experimented with different materials, as seen with this translucent dress, and once again, he brought back the tabby boots. Looking back now, Margiela's Spring 1990 collection is an undeniable classic, and you could even say that it changed the course of fashion history. You see, at the show that day, there was a young man in the audience named Raph Simmons. Still in school, he'd landed an internship working with the Belgian fashion designer Walter van Bierendonck, but he admittedly disliked the idea of a career in fashion, and was more interested in furniture design. That was all about to change though, because after Margiela's collection, he realized that he too wanted to pursue fashion. Nowadays, Raph is one of the most prolific designers alive, but if he hadn't gone to the show that day, there's a very real chance that we wouldn't be talking about him right now. Let me say though that as much as he loved the collection, not everyone felt the same way, and at the time, it was actually a bit polarizing. Yes, some people thought it was fantastic, but others hated it, largely because of how far it strayed from traditional high-end fashion. Nevertheless, the polarizing collections are often the ones that provoke the most discussion, and that's why nearly everyone in the industry knew his name after this show. For any designer trying to launch their own label, that sounds like a dream come true, but that was not the case for him. As much as he loved the creative freedom to make whatever he wanted, he never cared for the spotlight that came with it. And so just like that, Martin Margiela began planning his own disappearance. Martin Margiela's decision to disappear from the public eye came down to a combination of a few different factors. On one hand, he's always been an inherently private person, and on the other hand, he wanted to let his work speak for itself. Oftentimes in the fashion industry, we associate a brand with its founder or whoever the creative director is, and while I personally don't think that that's a bad thing, there are definitely instances where it distracts from what we really care about, which is the clothes. So how did Margiela go about staging his disappearance? Well, I touched on this a bit earlier, but basically he stopped making public appearances, he stopped giving interviews, and he even refused to be photographed. Speaking of which, I think that here is a good place to address the most famous rumor about Margiela, which is that there are no known photos of him in existence. Right away, let me say that this is 100% false. While there may not be many of them, we do have several confirmed photos of Margiela. 
Some of them were taken during photo shoots, some of them were taken paparazzi style. But either way, Martin is aware that these photos are out there and that people know what he looks like. And honestly, I think that the air of mystery he's created for himself has only spurred more curiosity about who he is. And if you ask me, I think that he plays into this a bit. Yes, he disappeared from the public eye, but it seems as if he wants us to know that there's something missing. One of the best examples of this is that he started using a plain white tag on all of his clothing. It's extremely simple and nondescript, but like I just said, you know that there's something missing. Why have a tag at all if you're not going to put the name of the brand on it? I will note that the tag wouldn't remain blank, but the point I'm making here still holds up because he decided to replace it with something that is arguably even more cryptic. As you can see, it's three rows of numbers ranging from 1 to 23, and the cool thing here is that depending on the type of product, the tag will actually be different. I'm not going to go through each and every variation, but here's a list that shows what number will be circled depending on what type of product it is. So for example, the number 22 will be circled on the logo of every Margiela shoe. The only one that's really different is MM6, because rather than being treated as just another product category, MM6 is the name of a diffusion line focused exclusively on women's wear, so anytime you see that, just know it's essentially an offshoot of the brand's main line. Personally, I find this whole number system really cool, and it's also a brilliant marketing move, because it contributes to Margiela's if you know you know status. Now another great example of the something is missing concept is this photo of Margiela employees. Right away you may notice that there's one empty chair, and that empty chair is symbolically reserved for Martin. To be fair, we don't know if leaving an empty chair was his idea, but it just goes to show that the brand actively feeds into this mystery man narrative. As a side note, you may have noticed that everyone in the photo is wearing a white lab coat, and the reason behind that is actually pretty interesting. To create a sense of unity among his employees, Martin instated a company policy requiring everyone to wear the same plain white lab coat. Not only did this new uniform place them all on common ground, but it also encouraged them to focus less on the clothes that they were wearing and more on the clothes that they were making. This policy is still in place today, and if you want to see for yourself, just walk into any Margiela store and you'll be greeted by someone in a white lab coat. But anyways, let's go back to what I was saying, because there is one thing that I want to be very clear about when discussing the anonymity of Martin Margiela. Yes, I do think that the brand intentionally leans on this aspect of its reputation, but that does not make the element of mystery here any less authentic. If anything, it makes it more authentic, because Martin really is an intensely private person, and this is something that has been seamlessly woven into the brand's identity. That's why his decision to disappear didn't hinder his progress, it actually helped. I'm sure that he would have been successful either way, but the fashion world quickly became enamored with this mystifying designer putting out stunning collection after stunning collection. Still behind the curtain, he continued to do so for several years, but then in 1997, we got word of news that no one had been expecting to hear. Martin Margiela had been named the new creative director of Hermes. Martin Margiela's appointment as the creative director of women's wear for Hermes came as a bit of a surprise. Through his work at his own label, he'd established himself as one of the more avant-garde designers in the industry, and this didn't quite match the profile of a more traditional, somewhat conservative fashion house like Hermes. In fact, during their first meeting, the chairman of Hermes, Jean-Louis Dumas, is said to have asked Martin if he was going to start cutting their bags in half. Part of him was of course joking, but part of him was being serious, because this is the type of radical approach that Martin had become known for. The bottom line was that Hermes was taking a chance on him, and looking back now, I think we can say that things worked out. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that he completely reinvented Hermes, but that was never really his intention. In fact, he sort of used it as an opportunity to reinvent himself. His collections for the fashion house explored a side of luxury and elegance that he had never really explored with his own label, and there's even an argument to be made that his Hermes collections were just higher-end reinterpretations of his Margiela collections. I'm not saying that this was always the case, and he did of course explore a number of new ideas, but there is an undeniable element of overlap. He would only remain at Hermes until 2003, and during that time he released just 12 collections, but overall I think that this is a really interesting part of his story. The collections were great, there's no question about that, but it's really fascinating to wonder what made him want to do this. Like I said earlier, his decision to join Hermes came as a surprise to many, and that's because it was so uncharacteristic for a person as reclusive as he was to lend his name and talents to another major fashion house. 
Maybe it was that same urge he felt as a design assistant that made him go start his own label. It's not uncommon for successful independent designers to want to go join big name fashion houses, so in that respect, I guess Martin may have been no different. In the meantime though, he was still pushing forward with his namesake label, and with each step of the way, he continued refining the design language that he's become so well known for. He pushed his interest in deconstruction to the absolute limit, he continued experimenting with materials and different silhouettes, he doubled down on his signature white, black, and red color palette, and he never stopped thinking of new ways to present his collections. My personal favorite was his spring 1998 show, where instead of using models, he literally had Margiela employees hold the pieces up on their hangers. Not only was this an interesting concept, but it served a functional purpose as well, because all of the pieces from this collection were designed to be completely flat when not being worn, so the best way to show them was by not wearing them. That is just one out of many examples that we have of Martin's brilliance, and when you take a step back and look at it, it's almost funny in a way. He's developed this reputation of being a low-profile guy who makes these timeless, somewhat understated pieces, but his approach is completely out of the box. He simply has different ways of thinking about aspects of fashion that we take for granted, and that's why he headed into the early 2000s as one of the most celebrated designers in the industry. But unfortunately, there was trouble ahead. In 2002, Mason Martin Margiela was officially sold to the OTB Group, which is a fashion conglomerate founded by Renzo Rosso that currently has stakes in brands like Diesel, Marnie, Jill Sander, and Amiri, just to name a few. It's not exactly clear why Martin decided to sell Margiela, but it's also not that crazy to think that he did, because being purchased by a conglomerate is a very common way for independent brands to expand. That may not have been the only reason though, because around this time, rumors started circulating that Martin simply wanted to step away from fashion. While this may have been the case, he did stick around for a few more years, but in 2008, the rumors started circulating once again, and this time they were for real. Martin Margiela officially retired from fashion. At the time of his retirement, he said nothing, but years later, after winning a prize at the Belgian Fashion Awards, he released a statement explaining his departure, saying, I felt that I could not cope anymore with the worldwide increasing pressure and the overgrowing demands of the trade. I also regretted the overdose of information carried by social media, destroying the thrill of weight, and cancelling every effect of surprise so fundamental for me. That gives us insight into why he walked away, and it also gives us insight into why he hated the publicity. After Martin left in 2008, the ownership group decided to let the existing design team continue running the show without identifying any one person as the lead. This is unusual, but it's not unheard of, and if you think about it, it sort of makes perfect sense. Margiela is supposed to be this brand without an identifiable figurehead behind it, so if they'd gone and instantly appointed someone like Raph Simmons, they'd have been compromising that part of the brand's identity. Now even though we don't know much about who was on the design team, we do know what they accomplished together, and while you may not have known it, there's a very good chance that you're familiar with their work. Earlier on I joked that the masks in Margiela's spring 1989 collection were giving off Kanye vibes, and that is no coincidence. It's a fairly well known fact that Kanye is a massive fan of Margiela, and he's even rapped about it saying, what's that jacket, Margiela? Doctor say I'm the illest cause I'm suffering from realness. This might be a bit of a stretch, but I've always imagined that the Margiela jacket he's talking about is the famous white lab coat, which looks exactly like something that a doctor would wear. Either way, his passion for the brand does not end there, because he was personally styled by the Margiela team for his entire Yeezus tour, and this included a series of now iconic masks. While these masks were, in part, customized for him, they originated from one scene in Margiela's Fall 2012 and Fall 2013 Couture collections. Nowadays, they're looked back upon as a defining part of this tour, and by the way, if you're curious, he was able to see through them. The jewels may slightly obstruct his vision, but other than that, it's simply an embroidered chiffon veil. Another thing that I think is worth mentioning here is why Kanye decided to wear these masks. Aside from the fact that they look amazing, he suggested that he liked the idea of people going to his shows and experiencing his art, all without ever seeing his face. I really like that explanation, because it's basically the same exact reason that Martin never made appearances at his fashion shows. You're not there to see him, you're there to see what he's made for you, and the mask provides a degree of separation that makes that possible. As I'm sure many of you have seen, Kanye has been wearing masks everywhere recently, so I wonder if this has been at the forefront of his mind, and I also wonder if we might see him break out one of these Margiela masks anytime soon. 
I won't get my hopes up, but this is still a cool part of the brand's history, and it was all made possible by the design team that stepped up when Martin left. As much as everyone loved their work, the design team would only remain in charge until 2014 because that is when John Galliano was appointed creative director. Prior to joining Margiela, Galliano had made a name for himself by directing for the likes of Givenchy, Dior, and his own eponymous label. From a design standpoint, he was an interesting choice because his proclivity towards extravagance marked a new direction for Margiela. And from a personal standpoint, he was a questionable choice because there are few designers in recent memory quite as controversial as John Galliano. In 2011, following an altercation at a bar in Paris where he is said to have made anti-Semitic remarks, he was placed under arrest and was subsequently dismissed from his directorship at Dior. Afterwards, he denied any wrongdoing, but his lawyer later stated that the outburst was the result of overwhelming stress and addiction. Galliano was ultimately found guilty, and other than a temporary residency with Oscar de la Renta, he remained out of a job until 2014, which is when the OTB group invited him to be the new creative director of Margiela. For obvious reasons, this decision was a highly contentious one, but Renzo Rosso, the founder of the OTB group, affirmed that he wanted to bring about a new stage in Margiela's history, and that he was confident in Galliano's talent as a designer to make that happen. In his first move as creative director, Galliano decided to shorten the brand's name from Mason Martin Margiela to Mason Margiela. In case you aren't familiar, Mason is simply the French word for house, making it a common prefix before the names of different fashion houses. As far as his first few collections, they were relatively tame, and to his credit, he stuck to many of the same silhouettes and color palettes that Martin and his design team were known to use. But as he settled in and became more comfortable in his new role, we can very clearly see him start to take more risks. Now this is just my opinion, and everyone is of course entitled to their own, but if you ask me, the Margiela collections in recent years have sort of been a mixed bag. I mean, some of them are just so far removed from the brand's history that if I didn't know any better, I'd probably have a hard time telling that this was Margiela. On the other hand though, there are certain collections like the Spring 2021 Ready to Wear collection that are simply fantastic, and I'll even go out on a limb and say that this is one of my favorite Margiela collections. Regardless of the quality of his work, there are still many people today who will say that he shouldn't have the position because of the controversy that we just talked about. But whether you love him or hate him, it appears that John Galliano will be with Margiela for the foreseeable future, because in 2019, he renewed his contract for an unspecified amount of time. That said, all we can do now is wait and see what the future holds. Before we close, there are a few final things that I want to address, starting with the question, how does a brand that prides itself on being mysterious maintain relevance in the fast-moving world of fashion? Well, in some respects, the answer is obvious. As we've discussed, Margiela is preceded by a long history of quality and innovation that has earned it a fiercely dedicated cult following. Nevertheless, we've seen them make a number of attempts to branch out to a larger audience, with one of the most prominent examples being their H&M collab. At face value, this might sound a bit ridiculous because many people associate H&M with low quality, fast fashion, but the silhouettes that they created for this collaboration actually weren't half bad. People still had mixed opinions about the whole thing, with many of them arguing that this collab was nothing more than a business decision, but hey, let's not forget that whether we like it or not, fashion is a business. Now this is not the only collaboration that I want to talk about, because under the direction of John Galliano, Margiela has released a number of sneakers with Reebok. This is no ordinary collaboration though, because it fused two classic models together to create a pair of tabby sneakers. Truth be told, I never expected to see Margiela working with Reebok, but the outcome has been interesting to say the least, and I'm curious to see what else, if anything, comes of this partnership. More generally, I'm curious to see if Margiela will form any new partnerships in the future. Between working with the likes of H&M, Reebok, and Kanye, it seems that pretty much anything is on the table, so this is something that I will be paying very close attention to. So that just about brings us to present day as far as the brand is concerned, but there's still one question left unanswered. Where is Martin Margiela now? Well, after leaving the label in 2008, he just about fell off the face of the earth. We didn't hear much from him while he was still active, so you can imagine how much we heard from him once he retired. But in 2021, after being away for nearly 13 years, he unexpectedly broke his silence. No, he was not making his return to fashion, but instead, he revealed that he'd spent his time away making art. 
He hosted an exhibit in Paris to display a series of sculptures, paintings, and installations that gave us a rare glimpse into how he perceives the world around him. You can see a few of the pieces here, and they really are thought-provoking. It's not exactly clear if this exhibit was just a one-time venture into the world of art, but from what I've read, it took him three years to put all of this together, so it sounds like he's taking this pretty seriously. And while you should never say never, this tells me that he really has moved on from fashion. It's a bit unfortunate because I know for a fact that he's still capable of putting together amazing collections, but at the same time, I know he made the right decision. The influence of his work can still be seen throughout the fashion industry today, and I think that it will be for a very long time to come. Because if you've learned anything from our discussion today, it should be this. People may call Margiela the Invisible Man, but that doesn't mean he's not there.